Okay. Welcome to the podcast, The Long Game, a place where time, effort, and energy matter. Today with me, I'm continuing the same uh, thread of obviously first reaching out to friends and colleagues, people I trust, I admire, and I feel very comfortable with, and today is no difference. Uh, today with me uh, is Paige Francis, Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at University of Tulsa. And it's Paige is someone I met several years ago when I joined my current university. She was in a similar role at a different school in Northeast some, at this point, probably four or five years ago. And the conversations, camaraderie, learning from each other was very natural. And it kind of uh, was able to be something that I can build upon, somebody I can always reach out to and get guidance, whether it's through Twitter or, or different ways, is definitely someone I respect, admire, and I welcome to the podcast. Paige, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the standard question, right? A brief introduction. What would you like to share about yourself and your experiences, maybe your journey up until this point uh, for the audience? Sure, so uh, my name is Paige Francis. I'm the VP of IT and CIO at University of Tulsa. I've been in Oklahoma for roughly 10 months. Prior to that, I was the assistant CIO at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Prior to that, and where I had the pleasure of meeting Milos, I was the first CIO at Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, and prior to that, I entered into my first CIO position at Northwest Arkansas Community College in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, what's interesting, if you look back through all of those experiences that I've almost hit the trifecta of different flavors of higher education, right? We've done community college, um, thriving, growing community college during the 2008 recession, share a sidewalk with Walmart corporate office. So lots of interaction with adult learners at the time considered non-traditional learners. Um, and then I was recruited away to a sweet, precious, adorable, wonderful, very centered liberal arts university in the Northeast corridor. Um, and then I wanted to get back home and so jumped right into a 30,000 student R1 public institution state run. Um, and now I've found my way back into that sweet, precious environment of a liberal arts institution um, in Oklahoma, 45 minutes from my aunt's front door in Northwest Arkansas. So throughout all of that, I think that um, the, my transition has been unique in that I never planned to have anything to do with technology. I certainly never planned to enter into the education or higher ed industry. And now I feel so well-rounded in this position that I'm really able to, and especially as technology has evolved over the past decade, I'm really able to focus on the things that interest me most. And that's making sure that the services that are provided or the services that are needed and done in an excellent way. 10 years ago, I was a very unique blend of CIO in that my focus areas are communication and connectedness. Um, and now I'm thrilled that that's standard or what we hope would be a standard trait of, of a CIO. So um, I'm, I'm really just excited about the future that's to come, love being at the University of Tulsa, and really this sort of crazy pandemic COVID-19 environment is almost my sweet spot, right? Like I love having continuous challenges and really seeking for that continuous improvement piece. So higher ed, I think I'm here to stay, CIO, I guess this is it. Um, and I'm just thrilled to join you today, Miroš. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned brave up front, because uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, nothing great in the history of the world was accomplished from the comfort of one's chair or couch. Right. You go in and you're never going to know if you're going to be prepared enough or ready enough until you're in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of sitting on the sidelines is really not something that um, I could ever see you do. Nope. So, so across those four different institutions, kind of three plus one CIO roles, the breadth of experience is, is uh, remarkable. Uh, you mentioned communication and connectedness. Uh, mm -hmm. Matters more now than ever. 
How are you leveraging that now? And what do you, as a CIO, as a proven CIO, who has done this more than once, what are your main or primary priorities or areas of focus in today's environment? Today's environment, well, I'll tell you, I, I've said this numerous times over the past couple of months, and it's almost shameful to mention, but I feel as if everything that I invested from the minute that I joined TU 10 months ago, every bit of it prepared us for March 11th of 2020. Um, I, have, I used to have to defend my style um, for communication and you know, immediately getting out there and building real meaningful reciprocal relationships with the campus. Um, that's what I started doing in, in mid-July of 2020 as I entered the, the TU environment and getting to know the students, getting to know the faculty, getting to know, you know, what has IT done wrong? What has it done right? Getting and, and going out and reaching peers in the city who are also CIOs at other higher ed institutions just developing these relationships. Um, March 11th hit, and I feel as if almost immediately we were able to target and serve our campus in the exact way that it needed to be served because I listened and I knew the campus. And so the focus point right now is really, even though seemingly that March 11th, March 13th time period, it appeared as if we were almost effortless in our ability to transition in less than 10 hours to remote. Um, you know, we were the duck feet under the water. We were scrambling a little bit. So the primary focus for us right now is knowing that when we do return to campus, it's going to happen again, right? Like we're going to have to go back and, and go remote. I want to make sure that no matter what direction we turn in, that it impacts our faculty and our staff and our students as little as possible, while also practically saving the lives of my IT staff. I mean, I saw, even though people on the outside didn't see it, I saw how this impacted the staff that, that I care so much about. I want to make sure that we do it with a little bit more grace in the fall. So we're planning for about four or five different scenarios of how fall 2020 could shake out. And I want to make sure that throughout all of that, that everyone has the exact same experience, that it's an equitable experience, no matter where you are, no matter what device you have, no matter what your internet connectivity is, no matter what your comfort zone is, fall is going to be a season of choice at Tulsa University. And um, I want to make sure that we are able to just pivot on a dime. I know that if you were to put together some sort of a wordle, or I'm not even sure if that's what they're called anymore, but if you were to put together some sort of a wordle of all of the terms that are used in reference to IT right now, right? It's, it's pivot, it's responsive, it's future-proof. People get so tired of all of these words, except now all of a sudden, we're literally having to live them. Like if you are not right now focusing on how your institution can pivot better, then you're gonna be in a world of hurt at some point in November, 2020. I can almost guarantee it. So it's just making sure that we stay the course. And you know, as a CIO, I think I wrote a blog post on this when I was at Fairfield, so probably five years ago, and it was something about CIOs being, um, having to be adept in palm leadership, right? Like it's, it's almost like palmistry and tea leaves. You know, we're looking into a crystal ball. We're planning for things that are completely unforeseen, doing it on gut instinct and experience. But those of us that are sitting back, not really scrambling right now and haven't been scrambling for about a month, it really reinforces that the direction that we've been heading in is right. Now, that's not a time to sit back and rest on your laurels. So, you know, it's just making sure that you stay that course, that you don't really get confused or lost in the shuffle of all of the chaos, really. So right now, it's just staying focused, doing what we're supposed to do, and really making our primary objective being able to best serve our users, no matter what direction the future might take for us. 
They are very fortunate to have you where your skills of communication, connectedness, building those relationships, being that hub in the hub and spoke model, if you will, is mm -hmm. what's absolutely needed in, in times like this, in times of panic, times of crisis, everybody handles it differently. You and I, and maybe a few others might be okay, right? Roll up the sleeves and say, you know, throw your best shot. Let's yeah, see. Let's do it. Let's, let's see what's going on. We're going to handle this. And then others don't respond the same way. Right. So you mentioned the word pivot several times. Um, what are some of the things, and yes, none of us have the uh, magic eight ball and we're not going to know what six months from now will bring entirely. We can speculate. But maybe what are some of the opportunities right now across your organization or perhaps across higher ed as a whole that um, we could all collectively pay a bit more attention to learn from and pivot and adjust in that particular direction? Right. I mean, imagining every, sim every single scenario and building the entire IT environment to be able to support it and continue having these conversations up and down the chain, um, making sure that everyone aware that this could be coming. These are not chicken little moments. Um, we know that something is coming, we just don't know what. So for example, you know, fall 2020, we anticipate to have some level of physical presence on our campus at the University of Tulsa. What does that look like? Don't know. We envision that, um, that we will have students living and, and learning on campus. We envision that we will have classrooms open. We will have sororities and fraternities. We will most likely have sports in some fashion. Um, we will be providing food service. We will have library checkouts. Um, what is this going to look for? What will the classroom look like? How contactless can we make it? How easy and connected can we make our campuses so that we don't have to interact with students if they have lost their ID card? How can we make the ID card on a mobile device so that if they do mess something up on a Saturday at 11 at night, that they don't have to wait until we can issue them a new card on Monday morning because that means they miss out on their food plan? I mean, how can we eliminate these gaps in service while also making sure that we have to con contact our students and connect with them and physically touch them as, as little as possible? The classroom environment, right? Like we are planning right now for a classroom environment that might have five students sitting in it and that might also have their faculty member teaching from their office across campus and might also have another half dozen students learning from their apartment on campus. And we may have another student who's logged in from the Arkansas Delta or with terrible internet connectivity and into this classroom. And how do we make that kind of classroom feel equal for everyone, regardless of where they're learning from and on what device they're learning from? And so, you know, we need that back and forth discussion. What does that look like? How much do we have to invest in these classrooms? We have to be prepared then for the very next day to whoop, we're all online. Okay, well, what does that look like? How can we make sure that all of our people can now leave a campus again and be better prepared for that transition home than they were in early March? What does Thanksgiving look like? Are we gonna come back after Thanksgiving or are we gonna have a giant break Thanksgiving through spring. Will we consciously go remote after Thanksgiving, still have classes for that final month between Thanksgiving and the Christmas holiday break, and then start back up on spring? What does this look like? And so with every scenario, you know, we're just trying to make sure that whatever COVID throws at us, because if it's not COVID, it's gonna be something else in the future. Um, and now we know that, we always suspected that something like this might happen. How will we respond to that? How will we be able to pivot given all of that, right? I guarantee you the students are thinking about this. Students that come on campus, they're gonna be coming with 50% of the luggage that they brought a year ago to campus because they're gonna be recognizing, I'm gonna to have to box all this stuff up in two months maybe. I might have two hours to box up all my stuff. So they're gonna be more reliant than ever on the devices they bring and the connections that they're able to make on campus than they ever were before. 
So it's just making sure that we're continuing to do our job the way we've always done it in a completely new world. Lots of questions. Um, some of which can be answered. Others at this point are probably going to be best efforts, which you're not going to know uh, mm -hmm. until that time comes. As Mike Tyson was famously known or quoted for saying, everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face, right? right. You walk out there, you have a game plan, and then something else happens that you couldn't have not accounted for three months prior. Right. You get punched and, in the face, you see the stars, and then you shake it off and go, okay, yep. let's do this. Roll up your sleeves. Right. Um, how do you envision, I mean, we talked about a lot of different things and we're all talking about this. I talked to a number of CIOs across North American higher ed and some are saying, some already have made decisions that they're not coming back after Thanksgiving. They're going to do it remotely. Um, some are saying that they're going into three full-time semester modes, mm -hmm. fall, spring, and entire summer in order to allow students to catch up with their studies and not fall behind and not graduate a full year later because of something like this. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take this to a higher level, 30,000 foot level, when it comes to future of life or future of work all collectively, what are some of the things that you think will take out of this pandemic and they may not go back to the way they were um, for some of us or maybe most of us? I already have conversations with my team members and my colleagues and some have expressed interest in working from home um, three out of five days, mm -hmm. right? Because the type of work they do, they're not necessarily client facing, they're developers and they can do that from anywhere. They have a, maybe even a better setup at home with six big monitors in their office where they feel comfortable uh, while others are in client facing modes and they have to be there to open that door, at least right now, unless the clients obviously decide not to show up. Right. What are some of the lessons or, or things or opportunities that you think we'll all collectively as a humanity perhaps learn when it comes to work, life, balance, if there is balance, or maybe integration is a better term? Right. Um, you know, I think I, I agree with you. I have always been a supporter of work-life balance and flexible work arrangements. I believe that if a professional is delivering on what their job is, then they're doing their job, right? I, I don't need to keep tabs on anyone. Um, I believe, and I'm very thankful right now to be at an institution where leadership supports this, um, you know, I'd rather be safe than sorry. The health and the safety and the wellness of our staff, faculty, and students is just absolutely the top priority. Working from home, choosing to not come in for certain things, um, why in the world would anyone not support this? And I mean, you remember, Milos, it's not been that long possibly only two months since you've known people who have actively pushed against supporting that, who have not been open for, for this sort of working from home environment. We've learned, it took me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very supportive of flexible work arrangements. I don't care where anyone works from as long as they get their work done. And it took me a week or two to get my bearings um, on how to most effectively work from home. I've got a 10 year old daughter, a 13 year old son, um, and boy, are they a distraction. And having to fight with them over internet connectivity through the day, I mean, my work flat out takes precedence over Fortnite and Roblox, but you know, they don't believe that. Um, so I think that the, the working from home piece and the flexible work arrangements for sure. Another piece is, you know, in, in I think probably both of our institutions, you know, we still had faculty that did not allow technology in the classroom, did not allow students to come in with laptops or open those laptops because they considered them to be a barrier. Um, I see that changing because I have noticed that even some of our more staunchly anti-technology in the classroom faculty, they're the ones that are now training the trainer on some of the ways to better use some of our, our online systems. They are the ones that are participating in our Friday sessions where teachers are teaching teachers um, about how to do online teaching better. Uh, so they've really come out of their shell in these areas and they've experienced the technology. I'm curious to see how they'll receive it now in their classrooms a bit more. And another piece is, gosh, the meetings. You know, it's funny, I woke up, um, 
sometime last week and I had over on my bedside table, I've got these two magnets that I never gave to anyone. I saw these and I bought five and I've given out three and they just read something along the lines like, well, you know, you survived, it was a ribbon. And it's like, you know, you survived another meeting that could have been an email. Um, and that was just hilarious three months ago. And now I'm just imagining why in the world have I ever been forced to go to a meeting rather than have it from my office um, because it's more convenient for me, for everyone to come to me. I mean, how selfish is that of me? So I do see us embracing these online meeting environments. This has been one of our saving graces since COVID hit. It was in early January that our interim president um, had was really struggling trying to learn Microsoft Teams. She's like, how can I do this better? Um, flash forward to March 15th, and I'm asking President Levitt for you know, advice on how do I do this in Teams. I mean, so this has been more than any other experience in my life, watching the people that we have been trying to sell technology, to further technology to, um, embrace it to beyond its fullest has been super satisfying and it also makes me realize that if and when we get back to a physical presence on campus i sure hope that we don't lose the ground that we made there right i mean in speaking in one of my meetings earlier with um the university president she had actually said i mean i'm not sure that i want to be on campus more than two days a week in the fall i mean who says that if she's not doing it, that certainly is great model behavior for the rest of the campus, especially for those employees that feel as if it might reflect negatively on them if they don't want to come into the office. So it's just this whole culture shift. And I can't imagine that COVID won't keep us on our toes for at least the next five years, even if it doesn't repeat, right? Even if a vaccine happens and it doesn't repeat, we're all going to be a little bit on the edge of our seats. And it's, I think that we're going to walk away in a much better place. And it'll be super interesting because technology is now literally a part of everyone's life, not just ours. Absolutely. You, uh, you hit on a lot of good, good um, points there. One of them is it uncovered a lot of truths, right? All these things that we took for granted, this is just how we do it. That's how we've done it for the last decade or two or four. And at some point you've had these conversations, whether it was HR or somebody else about telecommuting policies and options, mm -hmm. and they were a no-go because that's not our culture. That's not what we do. That's not, mm -hmm. how do you measure for a, for a high touch environment? Right. And we're special and we're unique. And how right. do we, how do you measure productivity? And I go, how do you measure productivity of Joe sitting two offices down from me? Right. right. Measure the outcome and productivity. Don't measure how many hours they spend in a seat. Right. And I'm sure you've seen a meme, right? Because everybody talks about the digital transformation. I don't think everybody gets it. And there was a meme that I saw, saw online, like who led your digital transformation? And number one was your CEO. Number two was your chief technology officer. And number three was COVID-19. <laughs> and that's the one that circled. Yeah. Yeah. Because it threw us in, in, in two days, whether you were ready or not, you were on that ship. And mm -hmm. that ship is leaving the port. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the examples of leadership from your president mm -hmm. and how um, they themselves have said, maybe there's a different way or a better way to do things. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit more about the impact of leadership, not people in leadership positions, but actual leaders on success, growth, flexibility, and advancement of an organization? Absolutely. So um, it's interesting. Joining the University of Tulsa, It's a wonderful environment. Um, but I will also say that in some ways it pertains to technology and, and some administrative mindsets. It, it, it felt a bit last July like unearthing a time capsule that had been buried for 20 years, right? Not five years, not 10. I'm gonna go with 20. Um, it's possible 25 or 30. But you know, it's, it's, it's unearthing that and recognizing, wow, we, we've, got, we've got some work to do. And of course, that's a challenge, so I'm all in. Um, pretty quickly after some assessments, I started recognizing that 
I was being invited to more tables than I'd been invited to before. And I think it was this leadership within the university took notice of the fact that I was able to drive change and it was well received. And in a traditional higher ed environment, those that are labeled change agents, change makers, whatever, um, typically remember they used to do all the change and then they had to hightail it out of the institution, right? Because nobody loved it. Um, within about 24 to 48 hours of COVID, the conversation started talking about how my reporting line should change. And so that reporting line changed from reporting to the EVP to reporting to the president of the university. And it was because capturing, she was trying to, she was trying to capture that we needed to move quickly to be able to address what was going on. I have never in my professional experience witnessed the impact of of leadership on an institution the way I have at TU through this crisis. Once again, I feel as if I've spent my entire past 10 months, if not my entire career, preparing for this exact moment. But I'll focus more on the CIO role as opposed to, I mean, the, the leadership at TU is stellar. They are empowering me to do everything that I need to do. They are getting out of my way and letting me do what I need to do. That's a big deal. What I wasn't expecting was for every article that I've read and written over the past 10 years to be accurate in that, this is literally what the role of the CIO is supposed to be doing. This is it, 100%. And if you haven't been focusing on how to drive a change-friendly culture, if you haven't gotten past that hump of being fearful to execute on things that needed to be completed, then you are not the CIO leader that you thought yourself to be. Absolutely. We um, are in a position like it's our position to lose and you've either got it or you don't. And I've never seen it play out more obviously, obviously than through this COVID pandemic. Absolutely. You have the opportunity, not just whether it's yours to lose, you often have the opportunity to make the position, to create right. it into what it needs to be. One man's point of view, I'm glad, even though I'm sure the EVP was a, is a wonderful person. Uh, one man's point of view, I do believe in 2020 and beyond, in the year that we actually le uh, live in, your most senior technology executive has to have the right seat at the table and has to report to the CEO or in our case, university president. Now, you also mentioned, this is, again, we haven't spoken uh, in a while, but it's, you know, certain things always feel comfortable and natural. And the way you're answering, you're almost giving me a layup into the next question. Culture, organizational culture. And it's a particularly unique set of circumstances and parameters in higher education. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that impact in either positive or less than ideal ways this need to grow and change. I have seen and experienced myself and through words and eyes, eyes of some of my colleagues, um, a number of institutions where they say, we want transformation, we want change, we want advancement, we want growth. And then let's say one of my colleagues enters uh, and then they go, well, maybe not that much, right. right? Because that's not, again, back to the culture. It's not comfortable. People are comfortable. People drive to work the same way every single day because it's comfort. They get stuck at the same light. They, sit, they hit the same pothole because that's what we know, mm -hmm. right? So how do you find ways to maybe influence and shape this culture to be more receptive of the change that they actually need to be successful? Right. 
So I think, you know, it starts with building those relationships. So you, when, you, when you walk into the room, you're not IT trying to sell something. You're not a member of administration trying to sell something. You're not one of the dreaded VPs that makes mu too much money and is going to come in and tell people how to do things. Um, you know, I think that it's really believing in what you're doing, knowing your environment, listening to your audience and developing a story around it, right? You walk in and you have the conversation and you recognize that it could maybe not go in the direction that you expect it to, but still not fearing that conversation, walking in, talking about where we're at, walking in with your pockets full of data and stats and past history. Here we are. This is where we are. Can you argue this is where we are? No. Here's where we need to be. Boy, wouldn't this be a great environment. In order to get there, it's going to be tough. And owning that up front, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be disruptive. You're not going to enjoy this part, right? Um, but here's what we're going to do to make it easier for you. Are you willing to invest in us? If so, then we're willing to invest in you and let's do this together, as opposed to IT just doing it and you're gonna experience it. Um, change that needs to happen, needs to happen. The problem is, is that when people started using those buzzwords of the change agent and all of that, that was literally still at that point to where a lot of change was just being done for the sake of change. Or there were old regime, old school IT leaders that didn't really know what it meant for it to be good change or bad change, right? And so you were really up against that. So the first thing you have to do as a leader is identify, do we really need to do this? And if so, then why? and then vet it and bounce it off against the squeakiest wheels in your institution, right? Because if someone's gonna yell at you, you know who that is. I knew who that was one month after joining TU. And that's why when I have ideas, hey, I'm about to do something crazy, what's the response gonna be, right? Like I immediately go and I visit these people because I know that they're gonna share with me and they're gonna support it or they're not. Um, I think it's really just knowing your audience and making sure that you're looking these people in the eye, that you're having those conversations, that you're willing to change your outlook and your mind. Like, I might be wrong. Um, I've been wrong numerous times and just owning that and going, yeah, you're right. I probably won't focus on that right now. Gotcha. And then walking away, that builds so much confidence. But you're not making changes for IT. Most of the things that we're driving don't benefit IT in any way, shape, or form. In fact, they're typically significant hassles, right? Giant time suckers that result in nothing personally and tangibly for me, but we're doing it for the betterment of this institution. So you need to make sure that everyone is aware of the fact that you're doing this really to improve their way of doing things. And there's still people that have their comfort zone and it's still gonna be uncomfortable. And that's why throughout the entire process, you have to just keep saying this. I know this is uncomfortable. I know this is not something that you're used to. Trust me, right? Trust me until you have a reason not to trust me. And then that's pretty much the way that we've done everything. We're going through it to you, some significant administrative modernization efforts. They're significant. And I've been named the executive sponsor driving all of this. And I am making sure that every point of the way they know who to contact, it's me. And if they are impacted by this, or if they have questions, I'm gonna mark time off my calendar and we're gonna have the conversations because these are important works. And if we don't get them done, and this is an, another example of how the university has run for 20 years, we're gonna complete and we're gonna complete better and we're gonna be the better for it. It's just being accountable and being present and being real, being authentic. Change, right? Um, whether you're changing something that's procedural, reducing you know from 18 clicks to two uh, or making a more friendly user experience or whether you're taking it a step further and really kind of building the environment of innovation mm -hmm. and i look at innovation as kind of deposit prerequisite um 
foundation for our future. Mm -hmm. If you look at across all many in different industries, transportation, hospitality, they were all at the very top until one day they weren't. Right. Right. And they could have innovated themselves. They could have been more in touch with the market demands and the way environment changed and shifted at homes and works and uh, at work and, and jobs and everywhere else. But they chose not to do that. What are your thoughts on innovation itself? What is it to you? What does it mean to you? Obviously, it doesn't always have to be groundbreaking, but what is it to you? How do you find time for it? How do you provide resources and time for your teams to be able to actually look up and not just keep the lights bl blinking green? Right. So, you know, I, I tend to look at everything as just a green field, right? Like, here's where we're at. Don't rule anything out as a possibility. I need to make sure in all environments that we are foundationally capable of supporting innovation. I feel as if every institution that I've walked into has not been prepared <laughs> to foundationally support innovation, right? So you've got that work to do and I'm 10 months in. What we are trying to do at this juncture at TU, we recognize the beautiful opportunity that being a little bit outdated provides for us. And it gives us the ability to build everything right, right now from the ground up with no legacy entanglements. And so we are mapping out a digital transformation effort that will empower us to leapfrog our competition. Now, that primarily from an IT perspective in higher ed, that involves the student experience, the user experience, teaching and learning, you know, all of those standard pieces parts. It's not even in our scope right now to pretend that we as an IT department are going to be truly innovative. We are going to be innovative for the University of Tulsa, doing things differently and better than has ever been done before on our campus. But once we get to this point, and I think that this should be sometime mid-fall, we've not lost track on any of our projects through this COVID thing. Um, we're still pressing forward. I look more towards our faculty to be our innovators. And we have not provided an environment historically that's been conducive to them being able to get out of their shells and be more innovative or be able to really dig into their innovative acts and their thoughts within our university environment. So what we are starting to do now is develop those relationships with those next level researchers um, and find out what their needs are to really spread their wings a bit more on the campus. Um, there have been a couple of instances in my background where I really wanted to be able to just stake my claim to being the most innovative on the campus. And when I, and, and it, was a, it was some years ago, and I really think that the minute that I extricated my ego from all of that and really focused on the mission of what my job is and who I'm there to support, that I recognized that trying to drive innovation on a campus was really a lot more about me than it was about the campus. And so what I want to make sure is that at least foundationally, that we are providing an environment that's conducive to dramatic innovation by our faculty and by our researchers, whose job it is to do that. Once I have our structure set up and perfect, which never happens, but once I get there, then I can start being all about me and being super showy with the innovations. Um, you know, we're going to get our applause and we're going to get our good jobs um, from parents and from faculty members 
and from our student success team who says, wow, I heard from this student that this is improved or they were able to do this. That's why, that's why an IT department is on the campus. It's not to outshine our innovators, it's to support them. So that, that's my take on innovation. Absolutely, it takes, the, it takes a, a particular character and particular set of integrity, honor, empathy, understanding and service to be able to go away from some of the things that are innate in our nature, mm -hmm. right? Everybody in one day, shape or form, when, you know, at one point was a saber tooth tiger, but when there's something, a threat or a danger or whatever it is, first thing everybody naturally looks at, where do I go? Right. How do I stay safe? How do I get out of the way? Um, and being able to not only change their mindset, but actually change your actions so that you are in service of others is what differentiates those who are um, aspiring to be leaders and those who are actually leading organizations. Now, you talked about a lot of different things, time suckers, challenges, opportunities, digital transformation, changing things, ripping things out, elevating the standards of performance to your new norm, which will be everybody's norm very soon if I know you. Um, what would be that one thing, or maybe it doesn't have to be one thing, but what would be something that was a challenge or a frustration to you, whether it's currently or throughout your career, as you grew and advanced across these multiple institutions and have proven yourself time and time again in different environments, but yet there was this one battle that you had to fight pretty much every single time. Right. So there's been, there's been a couple. I think one of them, you know, I became a CIO in 2008 or 2009. So it's, God, I'm old. So it's been, you know, it's been a minute. And, you know, that was only 12 years ago or so, I think if I'm doing my math right. Um, but wow, higher ed was different then. I was hired in coming from industry. I came into higher ed after working at Thomson Reuters in Dallas, Texas. Um, so 12 years ago, being able to enter into higher ed from business was not a thing. It was frowned upon. Um, I came in without a large amount of feeds and speeds experience. I've not been the network engineer. I've not crawled around on the floor and wired a closet. I've not done any of that. Um, I came in with a little bit more of a, of a frosted side, right? Like I was the application developer and web developer and all this kind of stuff. And I've always been all about getting to know the user because it's sort of what I cut my teeth on in corporate America. Um, and so when I entered the community college um, as, and became the CIO, I immediately started building relationships with our faculty senate, you know, with our deans, with everyone across campus, getting to know our students, setting up things for students, all of this. And I can remember there was, there was quite a bit of side eye that was given to me by some of the old guard that were there at, um, at the community college. And, and not least of all was the administrative assistant in our department who reported up to me. And when I was recruited to Fairfield University, um, I can remember that the announcement came out that I was going to be going to Fairfield and I can remember, God, like it was yesterday, that she responded with what? Did, are you joining as their vice president of marketing? Like it was a bad thing, right? I mean, these were the lens, this was the lens that for so long my style of leadership was viewed through, right? Like I'm less than or sometimes not taken as seriously because I'm not an embarrassment when I'm sitting at the board table, right? Um, and that is something that I feel like I'll never forget it. And I carried it with me forever. And what's weird is that when she said it, she intended it as a put down. And I was like, oh, wouldn't that be great? But, you know, and this was before a lot of CIOs recognized that they really needed to market what they did, right? And so, you know, so now to flash forward 12 years, she's still an administrative assistant and I'm reporting to the president of the University of Tulsa and I'm serving the campus and I have confidence in this, possibly in the best way that they've ever received technology leadership. 
And a lot of it is because of that style that was so sneered at by sort of the, the feeds and speeds type of people, like the old regime and how they viewed IT. You know, and another piece that was a challenge that I dealt with, you know, it's just, it's the women in STEM thing. And a lot of that plays in with my style and all of that. Um, what's great now is that at the University of Tulsa, when we are having our executive leadership meetings, I am looking at our Zoom screen, our Brady Bunch screen, our happy hour screen. I'm looking at it and I'm seeing a female president, a female provost, a female vice president for IT and CIO, a female general counsel. I'm seeing females. And it's the first time that I've worked in an environment like this. And I can tell you, we're getting things done. We're not sitting on decision making. And we are going to further the University of Tulsa. We're going to take it to heights that it's just not reached, or it's been a while since it's been there. And it's really great to look at all of those past snickers and sneers. I mean, it's just that who's got the last laugh kind of moment. It's I was going to say that. Kind of great. Yeah. Well, you were ahead of your time, right? And now one of the greatest, I believe in that strongly, um, I've experienced that myself. IT is notoriously not good at marketing what we do. Mm -hmm. And having a leader who knows how to do that and knows how to tell a story is actually one of the most sought after skills today. Decade ago, maybe right. it wasn't, or it wasn't by everyone, but that's a, that's a, that's a huge plus. Now, uh, what advice would you have for those who aspire to your role, to those who aspire to leadership? My advice would be to ask yourself, what's stopping you? What is stopping you? Especially for, well, for anyone, you know, I can, I can give the traditional advice of, you know, find a mentor, have those conversations, dot, dot, dot. Um, but really think in, in turn, what is stopping you? Do not underestimate what you are capable of. And now more than ever in IT, in IT leadership, never underestimate the power you bring to the table with diverse experiences. You very well could be the, the key to that lockbox that's gonna open up magic at that company through the use of technology, no matter what industry, no matter what business, no matter what, whatever city, state, country, it doesn't matter. In technology, we are all just looking for that next great idea and never underestimate that you may hold it and don't hold back. That's my advice. If it's in you to do this, if you feel as if this is where you want to go, go there. The only person stopping you is you. I'm not someone, you know this, I'm not someone who normally needs a pep talk or motivation, right? But I feel fired up after that, right? Good. That, was, that, was, that was very, very inspirational and, and truthful and to the core. Whoever said that, and I don't even want to try to guess who it was, I think it was Ford back then, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Because if you don't, if you're starting with doubting yourself and not believing in your abilities and the potential that you have, um, it's a much more difficult for others to see that in you. Yeah. So um, I've asked you a ton of questions. You've provided a lot of value, a lot of knowledge and experience to the audience. And what I like to end with is to give you an opportunity to ask a question of those who will be there listening or watching this in, in uh, days and weeks to come. I mean, I guess my question would be, my question always is the question that I just end everything with, what advice do you have for me to be better? And that's how I recommend that everyone leaves every room and every conversation. That's how every email should be ended. How could I be better? What could you do to help me be better? And so for anyone that is listening, to this wonderful podcast, 
reach out to me at CIO page, Twitter, you know, let me know what I could do better because every day beyond today, I will only get better if my weaknesses and if my gaps are pointed out. Spend a lot of time digging in and working on self-awareness. The Jesuit institutions helped me with that. That's that, you know, I, I went through the spiritual exercises and I feel like I still do every single day, um, but I know that I still have gaps and I'm always, always open to hearing about them because I grow from them every single time. That's a great, that's a great question. A great note to end the episode on. We're all work in progress and um, the moment you think you have it all or you know it all is the very moment that downfall begins. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much to learn from everybody we meet, interact with. And I really want to, I've learned so much from you over the years and I've learned even more today. I really want to thank you for your time, for joining me, sharing your thoughts and experiences. And I am looking forward to doing this again. And I'm looking forward to every single episode that you throw together. I mean, this is your thing, Milos. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who have listened. And always remember, there are no shortcuts to greatness. If there's anything you want, you have to put in time, effort, and energy. Thank you and have a wonderful day.